Dear Heavenly Father, today is a day that truly helps us to understand who you are and who we have become as your children, as sons and daughters of yours. And it's still all about Jesus. It's always, always about Jesus because it's only through him that we know by your grace that we are forgiven and that we are saved and that we have the promise that you give to us that we are saints now and will be forever saints with you in heaven along with all of our loved ones who have died in the faith of Jesus and are already with you. Help us to know that there are no more tears there. Thanks be to you in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Please be seated. You look at the title, the theme, what do you say? What's your response? No more Jesus? Did you, did you catch it? I caught it this morning. It's a major typo. Seriously. I didn't, I didn't plan that. It's, it's a mistake. And I'm going to take full advantage of it this morning. I, I, I don't know. Did you catch it? Did you look at it? I mean, what did you think when you first saw that? No more Jesus! Exclamation point. What, Terry? Frustrating? Pastor is crazy. You know, people have said that anyway, Terry, without something like this in print. But when I saw that this morning, I just went... See, anybody know what it's supposed to be? It, 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 I'm using the first lesson, the, the lesson that's coming from Revelation. And I don't know if you've picked up on the theme of the worship service. The theme is really talking about there being no more tears. That's what it's supposed to say. It's not supposed to say no more Jesus. It's supposed to say no more tears. Oh, wait till tomorrow morning. You know that life in this world of ours has been addressed or called a veil of tears. How many of you have heard that before? You all have. And it's, it, it's based only on one simple Bible passage out of Scripture. It's Psalm 84, verse 6, which says this, As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. And that, that Hebrew word, baka, means weeping, to weep, to cry, to shed tears. And even though our English Bibles really don't use this anymore, that phrase, valley, the valley of tears, is still very well known to us, isn't it? And the experience of life itself as a valley of tears, Right? And how apropos is that in regard to what has happened and is happening and continues to happen each and every day of our lives? And and that experience in regard to the, the valley of tears, the valley of weeping, and the valley of sorrow is not precluded for God's saints. And I do believe that looking out here, Sometimes I go up and down the pew lines and I look at who's here and you've heard me say this, a a flood of things comes to me in regard to what has gone on in your lives and what is currently going on because you know that you've been blessed with me for, it's going to be 11 years this December. You know, did you know that? (laughs) And it is a mutual blessing. I, I've been blessed with you for 11 years. But the longer that any pastor is with a group of people, obviously, it makes perfect sense that we get to know one another. And I get to know you quite well in regard to what has happened and is going on in your life. And I can look out at many of you right now, and what we're talking about here, the Valley of Tears, a lot of things are coming back to me. And all of the tears that have been shed. 
and the tears that are going to continue to be shed. We who believe in Jesus are God's saints. Do you hear that? Loud and clear. We who believe in Jesus crucified, risen, ascended, and coming back again. We are God's saints. But folks, we are not immune to sorrows, are we? We are not. Quite the contrary. Yes, and on this All Saints Day, we rejoice. Go ahead, smile. I mean, we rejoice. Because even though in this life there is a valley or veil of tears, the day is coming. What day is coming? Eventually. That day of which John is talking about in the book of Revelation, when God will wipe away our tears forever. Many of our loved ones already have that. I, you know, I can't help but remember my dad. It's hard to believe. You, you, many of you have been there and done that. He died on September 29th, so it's already been over a month. And as I was looking at preparing for worship, I can't, you know, my dad would have great difficulty while he was alive. They called him Jake. He was actually John, and I was named after him. You know, Saint Jake. I'll be honest with you, I knew my dad well enough for, you, for him to even remotely believe that he was a, you know, going to be a saint. He had, he, had, he had difficulty with that because he knew he was not so saintly, if you catch my drift. I mean, how many among us do you feel saintly? Do you look saintly? What's a saint look like? But he knew, even when uh, his pastor, you know, I'm sharing some uh, things that happened when I was there because, you know, I was careful about playing the proper role with my dad because, uh, you know, what I told him one day was, Dad, I'm not your pastor, I'm your son. You, you have a pastor. And so I remember the last time that his pastor came And he communed both of us, and that was special. And many of you have done that with your parents and or other loved ones, that you were were able to have an intimate service with uh, the Lord's Supper being celebrated. And and it, it came up in the conversation where I did say that to Dad, is, Dad, I'm your son, not your pastor. He's your pastor. So I looked at Pastor John Cleavy, and I said, now let him have it. And I said that with all of the love that I could muster because what I meant, and he understood what I meant, is now you minister to him. You, You proclaim the gospel, the good news of Jesus to him. Because it's by way of that eternal gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, our personal Lord and Savior, that we know that we are forgiven and that we are saved and we're going to heaven and we're all saints. And obviously, that's what my dad needed to hear. That's what I needed to hear, even his pastor. That's what you and I all need to hear every time that we come. Even though we still live in this world in which there, there are enough tears that have already been shed and tears that are being shed even now and many tears to come up until the very last day when Jesus comes again. You know, there's pop psychology out there in the world today that says, you know, that that view of life is a valley of tears or a veil of tears, it's unhealthy. Have you ever heard of that? Because obviously, you know, the world, the ways of the world are diametrically opposed to the ways of God and what God tells us in here. Pop psychology would tell us there is no need to shed tears and have you, have you paid attention to the commercials that are being shown on TV these days? And especially the drug commercials? How, how many of the pharmaceutical companies out there are advocating one drug after another to take away tears, in essence, your pain and your suffering, so that if you buy our drug, go, buy, go, to, go to your doctor and say, hey, you saw this commercial and you want to take that drug, because if I take that drug then I won't, I won't cry because I won't have any pain or suffering. Then I always get the biggest kick out of it. 
Do you, do you listen to the disclaimer after every drug commercial? They're all the same. And if you listen to it, it should scare the ever-living daylights out of you. Oh yeah, oh by the way, and if you, you know, there are some ramifications that can happen and it might even kill you. That's the way I summarize it. So the disclaimer is given that way so that if it does kill you, you can't sue them. Because they forewarned you. But there are so many sources of tears, aren't there? Physical pain, grief over death, injustice, mistreatment, persecution, loneliness, rejection, sympathy for others. And as if that weren't enough, how about our own sin and our own guilt? And all you have to do is go through the Ten Commandments there. I, I don't know if you've ever done that. It, I, I'm not saying, you know, it'll, it'll be a downer if you do it. I'll tell you. Because if you go through each one of the Ten Commandments and ask yourself, now how have I sinned against this commandment? And you start writing things down. You know, you know how long your list is going to be? Arnold said he needs more paper. Well, he was just saying need for paper, but I'm, I'm laying it on you, Arnold. But you know what? It's true. You would, you would, you would virtually run out of paper. You can't, there's no way that you and I can list every single sin that we're guilty of. But we know that whatever those sins are, yes, and we're called uh, as God's saints to live His word, His will as best as we can, but in the midst of it we know we are, you know, Satan is going to do everything within his power to try to confront us with our sin and saying, you know what? <laughs> you know what? You're just kidding yourself. You're just kidding yourself if you believe that you're a saint because you're so full of sin and you've been so sinful, there's no way, no how that God is ever going to forgive you, let alone take you to his heaven. Come on. No way. Have you ever felt that way? I, I've had people come to me over the years, and I mean, they've been, they felt the burden, the guilt of their sin. And they came to me because they were so concerned about what it is that they said and or did, which I'm not saying they shouldn't have been concerned about it, but they felt that it was, it was so grievous that there was no way that God would ever forgive them. And there was no way for them to go to heaven. Now, is that true? No, 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 no. It is not. Remember who Satan is, the devil? He's the, Jesus called him what? The father of all lies? Oh, he can, oh, he can spin a tale. He, he can tell one lie after another, maybe even successfully to try to convince us to doubt that God would even think about forgiving us. We know that that's not true. Because you know what? The bottom, the long and the short of it is, even in the happiest moments of your life and my life, there is there's some sorrow. And you know why that is? Because nobody's perfect and nobody has the perfect life. And, and, and that's, that's part of the sinful reality of the world in which you and I live. But what did, what did God do about it? In compassion for us, he sent his son Jesus to enter our veil of tears. And all, if you read through the Gospels and saw, I wonder how many tears Jesus literally shed while he walked the face of the earth. Because there's many accounts where he did that very thing, didn't he? How about Mary and Martha, John 11, when their brother Lazarus died? And how he wept over the city of Jerusalem in regard to knowing their, the, the coming divine judgment that was going to take place. And what about his path? Do you, think, do you think that he cried many a tear as he was being arrested and as he was being uh, flogged and as he was being crucified on the cross? Because remember, he was one of us. You know, Jesus wept in John 11. It's the shortest Bible passage, John 11, verse 35. I, I, I think Jesus cried a lot, a lot more than is recorded in the Holy Gospels. But he came 
to do much more than simply weep with the sorrowful, didn't he? What did he come to primarily do? He came to take away our tears. And he did that in many cases in performing miracles in the gospel accounts. And he's done that for all of us too. He came to dry our tears and to pave the way of knowing and believing God's word that one day he will wipe away our tears for how long? Forever. And so that's, and if you think about it, that's really the response. That's God's love for us through Jesus. Anybody from, uh, do you remember a a stewardship emphasis that took place in our church body many years ago called His Love, Our Response? Do you remember it? It was many, many years ago. Anyway, when I was back in Illinois, we had it, and I was one of the facilitators of that. And it made this so easy based upon God's love for us through His Son, Jesus, we're called to live a life of response to His love for us through Jesus. So what's that supposed to look like? If, if you think about it, we're called to come alongside of the sorrowful, of those who are crying tears, and to give them hope. Does that sound like something people need today? Oh my goodness, even before the fires came, I saw it. Now I'm seeing it even much more today. People looking for hope. Looking for and wanting comfort and strength and courage. And for people to come alongside of them to say, perhaps, not to say that they shouldn't cry, but maybe at a point to say, Don't cry. Let me dry your tears. You're not alone. I'm here to help you, to shoulder the burden, to mend things. No more tears now. It will be okay. I promise. Have you ever had to have been told or were you looking for somebody to tell you it'll be okay? Yesterday, I I shared this at the Bible study earlier, I was at the farmer's market and I couldn't tell you how many times I heard, I I usually go around two or three times because i got to see what everybody has before we're going to buy whatever. Are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? And it's like, wow. So right here, you and I, we are waiting and often we weep, but in this life we sow in tears. And what does Jesus say in the gospel lesson? Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And that's what we got, and that's our response then is what God says here. As we wait for the day that God will dry all of our tears, We should be looking for opportunities to come alongside other people and be there and and perhaps maybe even to literally help to wipe away their tears. To extend to them God's own love and compassion. To bring them the good news of Jesus. Not to shove Jesus down their throats, but when we're given the opportunity to share the love of Jesus who saw their tears who carried their sorrows, who cleansed them by his blood, and who will one day wipe every tear from their eyes. Do you think that that's the response that God would have us to live in response to his love? I think it is, and I believe it's scriptural. And I believe that, well, that's what we're doing with the the people from St. Rose because I'm sure they cried many tears, and now, now, now they're crying tears of joy. Because us crazy Lutherans are coming alongside of crazy Catholics, and we've got this commonality by the grace of God through faith in Jesus that we're all sons and daughters in Christ. We're all children of God, and that's what John says in our epistle lesson, the second lesson. He's our Father, we're His children, 
Let's come alongside of one another and especially those who are in sorrow, who have been shedding tears, and let's wipe their eyes. I really look upon that as something that we're doing with St. Rose, is that we're wiping the tears from their eyes. And God is blessing us to be a blessing. Look for other ways to do that out there. Because if you're paying attention, they're all over the place. They really are. God help us. In the name of Jesus, amen.